Everybody say hello. Every time nobody says it. I know it. God, <laughs> it, it, actually, pause it. Yeah. In Malek and Cell, it was a small group. I don't know, most, but it was just like silent. And, you know, there's the, the email blurb that we're going to be back, you know, in, in the fall. I hope. And I hope that we can get over and slowly begin to get over this isolation thing of where people actually can chat with each other a little bit. And, you know, because normally when I walk in the room, there's people talking. There's somebody eating a bagel in the front, and I can talk with people. There's just this engagement, and it is so silent now. And normally in the building, we have people kind of milling about. <sighs> I don't know. I hope we get back to that. So say something. Chatter away. Who watches basketball? I don't at all. I like to go to the games. I don't like to sit in my living room and watch it on the TV. I've been to one basketball game. I think. Maybe two. I have. Yep, I have been to two. Uh, yeah. And I guess is Wesleyan? No. Maybe somebody got into the next level up that was like, oh, maybe I guess it was Illinois. Yeah. 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 What am I saying? I don't know. Vision you're talking about. Yeah, right. But they. About yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, it's like the uh, the Chicago Bears, man, watching them play basketball, which would be oh, amusing. There's a football team and see these really big guys. Oh. Yeah, I know. Whatever. I don't do sports. I'm a science nerd. I watch football. Uh, I used to watch football. Texas a and football, and I go actually would go to a lot of a and football games with my dad. That was fun. But, yeah. I've never seen a Milliken football game. Part of it is, we don't have a marching band. And that just bums me out, man. Marching band was like, that was my favorite part of the whole football thing. All right, can you see that? No. Is it gonna get brighter? Here, I'll close some windows. Plunge room into darkness and I'll take a nap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things I am hoping as well as we shift into post-pandemic is that the idea of um, recording lectures and posting them and doing that is like, nah, man, if you ain't here for the lecture, get the notes from somebody because you missed it. I'm a one-off. I don't record myself. But at the same time, my entire uh, lecturing history is now on my YouTube channel. So probably they're going to just dismiss me and there will just be a robot AI that will be me and it will just be my YouTube videos playing. But just if that happens, no, if I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt in the spring semester in the winter, that ain't me. That's not me. Mm -mm. All right. So we've been talking about our different kinds of uh, ports of entry, which is a really good way of distinguishing and separating out different disease types. We're going to see that there are bacteria that you know cover lots of different ground. In fact, um, there are diseases that, or there are bacteria that will be on the surface. There are bacteria that you're inhaling, and they can cause a fit in both spots. Um, I was just trying to think about off the top of my head. There are probably some that you ingest and that will give you gastrointestinal difficulties as well. Uh, but this is just another kind of uh, access point that bacteria have in, um, into getting into us. And these are transdermal infections. And so we're thinking about ways of breaching the skin barrier. And just something that popped in my head before I flip off on this. Uh, there's actually a new little, uh, maybe even in the Journal of Microbiology, uh, a couple of new species of bacteria have been discovered aboard the International Space Station, which is an interesting kind of observation. They've been growing plants in soil on the International Space Station for probably 20 years. And soil has a lot of bacteria in it. It's a great breeding ground for bacteria. And the place is not sterile. And you know, as we said, you really can't survive without bacteria in you and on you. Uh, they've been swabbing all around 
the International Space Station and actually have identified some species that um, I think had never been seen before. And I'm not entirely sure, you know, they're doing DNA sequence analysis for this determination. Um, it's an interesting idea whether these are species that have existed on Earth. I'm pretty sure that's what it's going to be. But they happen to be in the ISS. That said, I am sure you can go out in the front yard and if you start looking around, you'd find bacteria in soil that probably has not been discovered before. I just put it off the top of my head. I'm not entirely sure, but I think so. Bacterial co populations are so diverse. Um, and not to belabor the point, but you know, the idea of different bacterial species is a little bit of a game to play, given that with humans, or with animals, we've got a pretty good way of determining speciation by asking if two um, organisms can successfully breed and produce viable offspring. And so, you know, that's the idea of a horse and a donkey produce a mule. But the mule is sterile, consequently we qualify the horse and donkey as two separate species. Um, it's a little bit fuzzy because apparently you can have a tiger and a lion mate and produce fertile, viable offspring. Which, from my definition, I'm like, all right, they ain't two different species. But um, if you're talking about asexual reproduction, you never have that kind of question of, can these two bacteria produce an offspring? And so speciation in bacteria is a little bit different, and we determine it based on some arbitrary rules about how close are their DNA sequences. So that's part of what this is about. Regardless, uh, it's an interesting idea. Still, we have our skin, your most effective defense mechanism. You don't really think about it so much, but your skin is, in fact, an incredibly potent way of keeping stuff out. Your skin is stuck together. And uh, contrary to what my child might think, washing your hands or using soap is not going to cause your body to dissolve. And let's think about that for a moment, because if you were to take a set of cells, tissue culture cells, or for that matter, certain bacterial cells, and you add soap, you absolutely blow apart the plasma membrane. So like, um, oh, for sure, red blood cells. You touch them with a little bit of soap, poof, they're gone. The inside of your cheek, like if your mom were to wash your mouth out with soap, you're not as likely because that actually, while not as tough as skin, it is a good epidermal layer there. But skin is incredibly tough. We've got this layer of essentially dead squamous epithelial cells up here, and they actually have covalent crosslinks between proteins in the whole system. And so, you know, they're not dividing anymore. They're going to get sloughed off. But what they can do is actually not have individual proteins that move about, but they just start linking everything together in that really tough covalent bond. Consequently, the outer layer of our skin is a more or less impenetrable uh, waxy covering. So as long as you don't punch any holes into this outer layer, you've got a pretty good seal on things. Now just think for yourself, do you have any cuts or scratches on anywhere on your body right now? I don't know that I do. I probably do, but I'm not sure. Maybe something right there. Uh, you're pretty good about maintaining this integrity. But obviously abrasions occur fairly easily. Uh, it's got to be reasonably deep, though, in order to get, actually get in. So we've got um, the very top layer. And then you start getting into uh, the epidermis and the dermal layer. Now this has actually got um, a lot of stuff. There's macrophages, things that can actually um, en engulf bacteria and stuff. And then the lower layer, the subcutaneous layer, is where we start getting into uh, the vessels. You know, we start having arteries and veins and nerves. So one of the things I've done, and it's an interesting thing to play with, is if you ever have a really good dissecting microscope and you have a splinter, stick your finger under there and take a pair of tweezers or a needle and start digging around on your finger. And under a microscope, you can see that this top layer 
is actually quite waxy. And you start kind of peeling it up. And then you get to a spot below that where it starts to get to be a little bit juicy. You actually start to see fluid coming out. And if you're doing the operation on yourself, it begins to sting a bit now. Ouch. And then you keep on digging. And, you know, as you're doing this under the microscope, it's like, okay, we're really starting to dig down pretty deep. And you're also starting to say, this is beginning to feel uncomfortable. And you can then pull like a splinter out. Um, you know, a splinter that is not really underneath getting into this part, you never even know it. You just, you know, don't even think about it. But if you've got a good splinter, that's actually jabbing in pretty well. And you start kind of dissecting the tissue out to get that splinter out. You get a much better sense about the waxy nature of the outer layer of the skin. And this waxy outer layer is providing a really good block. So we can break down the epidermal surface infections into a couple of different things. We're going to start with wound related, which is perhaps obvious. Uh, but then we also have infections that are not requiring a wound. They actually are occurring on the cell surface, or they're invading into some of the, uh, the sweat glands and things, like uh, getting a boil and stuff like this. But things that are wound-related, uh, opportunistic, often via fomites. Fomites are a term we use for surfaces. So bacteria-containing surfaces are fomites. So let's start out with one that you perhaps have heard of, uh, a uh, particularly interesting wound-related bacterium, uh, and that is another bacillus. Now remember, bacillus causes, a, or, or members of the bacillus uh, genus cause a lot of problems. Botulism being one of them. Uh, this is the bacteria that causes anthrax, bacillus anthracis. It is gram-positive, so it's purple, not pink. It's got an endospore inside. Uh, it is an aerobic bacillus, and it is found in the soil. It is quite likely, if we were to go out in the front yard, dig up a spoonful of soil, we could find anthrax bacteria in the soil. Uh, so we have a couple of different forms of disease based on how it's being picked around. Uh, inhalation is really serious. Inhalation is hard to do, but that's really bad news. Uh, you get the spores in a, uh, a, a volatile powderized form, and you can actually um, do some serious damage. Uh, were you even alive during September 11th, 2001? Well, that was when we had hijacked airplanes crash into the World Trade Center. But not long after that, there were envelopes of a white powder substance delivered to the U.S. House of Representatives that were, in fact, anthrax powder. And nobody, even to this day, knows exactly where it came from. But anthrax is a bioweapon. And in order to make weaponized anthrax, you actually have to go through some fairly sophisticated steps. Growing anthrax isn't falling off a log, and then you have to weaponize it by essentially shaving off this outer stuff to generate the spores and make them so that they're going to be in a real fine powder, because the bacteria itself is not particularly fine powder. And you can do that, and you now have a fairly nasty bioweapon. Uh, you open it up, and you get this poof of powder, and people inhale it, and inhalation is really uh, pretty dangerous. 92% mortality uh, if untreated. Even if you recognize it, it's still very deadly. Uh, it has, you know, if it's generated in a way that it, it can uh, poof about really easily and be carried on the air, very, very lightweight and dust. So that is the most lethal form of it. Uh, ingestion can happen when we have food that's been contaminated with it. Um, fairly lethal as well. Um, cutaneous, now meaning you have an open wound that gets infected. 20% uh, mortality. So 
here is a poor gentleman with um, an anthrax infection, and you start to get necrosis, the actual breakdown of the skin tissue around the site of entry. So we've got the cycle here. A biting fly can uh, land on a cow. The cow is able to bring material in. They're right at the soil, so they're eating dirt. They can get it that way. Um, you have pooping coming out. Um, exposure to oxygen causes the anthrax to sporulate. Those spores can get up into the air. You can inhale them. You can ingest it. You can get it on your skin. And you can continue the cycle back and forth this way. So um, it's something to keep in mind. I don't know how. It's not particularly common. Um, where livestock are raised, that's where you see it. Um, so it is often found in animals. Um, we've got actually a couple of different kinds of uh, mechanisms of action in terms of its toxicity. We're not going to get into too much. But there is um, a um, set of different factors, proteins, that can produce a lethal toxin uh, that will kill cells and tissues, or it can produce a toxin that causes edema or swelling, um, fluid accumulation, and both those are going to be fairly significant and potentially lethal. Um, so the male attacks in September had envelopes powdered uh, with powdered spores, 17 folks infected, 5 deaths. And around this time, the U.S. Postal Service was and probably still is screening for anthrax in packages, and they may be UV ir or irradiating packages. Um, there was, in fact, at one point in the Decatur at the downtown post office, um, somebody found spilled white powder, and they, of course, mobilized everything in the world. It turned out to be coffee mate, not, in fact, anthrax, but if you ever wanted to play an amusing prank, on someone, uh, the police, take coffee mate, put it in an envelope, and mail that to somebody. I didn't say that. I'm going to delete this recording. All right. Another bacterium that we know of uh, that is found in the soil and also um, can get into wounds and things is the bacterium that causes tetanus. This is a clostridium, uh, which is also the, uh, the bacterium that causes uh, botulism. So another bad news guy here. And um, clostridium tetany. And its primary symptoms are uncontrolled muscle contractions, which is in the physiology biz referred to as tetany or tetanus. So you have these complete contractions of the muscles now, um, the contractions occur from the excitatory signal, and this is being blocked by the botulinum in a similar kind of mechanism as the tetanus. Uh, you have the block of the signals, and the toxin blocks now the inhibitory signals needed to relax muscles. So. If you think about this, uh, the botulism toxin blocks the excitatory signal. It is blocking the ability of the neuron to cause muscle contraction. And so you put Botox in to relax those muscle cells. The tetanus toxin is now blocking the inhibitory signal that is, in effect, removing that signal from the uh, the contraction signal from the, the synapse, and it causes an increase in muscle contraction. Um, actually, nicotine would do a similar kind of thing, but this does it in a really significant way. And it causes uncontrolled muscle contraction, which results in a variety of different kinds of problems. Now, we have a really good way of preventing tetanus. Um, you know, you perhaps have had a tetanus shot. Um, everybody pretty much is going to be vaccinated uh, with the, nowadays, the DTaP vaccine, which is a combo of 
the um, diphtheria, tetanus, and bordetella pertussis, which is causing um, a real serious pneumonia and cough. And we can vaccinate people for it. So this is a good thing. Uh, one of the things with this specific bacterium, uh, Clostridium, as we've been seeing with uh, botulism and with tetanus, these are anaerobic bacteria. They don't grow well in an anaerobic, in an, in an aerobic environment. And so you find them deeper in the soil and culturing them then is not just easy to do because we talk about trying to culture anaerobic bacteria is a little bit more difficult. And we worry about them particularly in a piercing wound. So you step on a nail, you have a knife jab uh, that gets in pretty deep. And you get the bacteria, just like a stab in one of our stab cultures, it goes in and then the wound closes back up. You've introduced a whole range of bacteria in that stab. The aerobic bacteria begin growing and consuming any kind of oxygen that was introduced through that hole and fairly quickly the environment begins to go anaerobic and when it does that's when the botulism type or the, the clostridium types can actually start taking it, uh, you know, start operating and so we've got the tetanus clostridium growing in a deep stab wound and that's why you step on a nail if you've got some kind of deep unopened wound they will recommend that you get a tetanus shot right away the vaccine needs to be kind of re-upped fairly frequently. So the DTaP shot is what we're giving to lots of kids, and then you probably have it renewed like in fifth grade. And then as an adult, um, if you had stepped on a nail, if you're doing construction, stuff like that, you probably are getting a regular tetanus shot. So um, we have the toxins are modified, or the actual bacteria itself is modified. And that's what's actually in the DTaP vaccine. So um, it's part of the adolescent and childhood immunization um, schedule. And here we go. So two months, four months, six months, um, year and a half. And then you are actually changing the vaccine a bit. And primarily, it's just a tetanus shot. Um, as long as you're getting exposed to the potential, you have it. And it does a pretty good job. All right, another bacterium worth mentioning is Clostridium perfringens. This is a note, we've been talking about a lot of Clostridium. Clostridium are the guys that are really going to be nasty in the genus. So uh, Clostridium botulinum, Clostridium tetany, uh, Clostridium perfringens. This is known as gas gangrene. Um, the name is actually quite old. It causes necrosis and swelling from gas being generated. And again, puncture wounds. So uh, those are gonna be serious things. Necrosis is the breakdown of the tissue occurring through the presence of hydrolytic enzymes and the various toxins. All right, so in this case, we've got uh, an initial infection and this infection then has this cycle in which we get uh, the local tissue death leading to the production of fluid and the accumulation of fluid it increases and then you begin to have increased amounts of the bacterium present and as the cell membranes start to really degrade, uh, the bacteria can actually start moving away from the initial site and start leading to a systemic infection. That's a pretty serious problem. Uh, what you have then is a change in the way the muscle looks, which is what gives rise to the terms. Um, the initial infection, over time, as it begins to generate gas, it starts to necrotize the tissue, it gets quite nasty, and it begins to spread, and you start seeing this movement of uh, essentially the symptoms of necrosis. The very bright red region of the initial inflammation to 
the beginnings of necrosis to pretty much bad news and amputation. Mm -hmm. So let us not let it get that far. Uh, leptospirosis is another surface contaminant that can get into wounds. Uh, it's a gram negative. Now this one is aerobic. Um, so many of us have been exposed to leptospira. And we've got a variety of asymptomatic organisms. Um, rats are able to maintain it, wild animals, and it can even be found in our dear pets. Now, for us, it is in the soil, in the water, it can cause a range of different kinds of um, pathologies. Everything from infection in the brain, meningitis, um, to infection of the cells surrounding the heart, myocarditis, um, and a variety of different kinds of systemic failures, liver failure, um, kidney failure. Uh, if left untreated, it's pretty serious. Looking at the population though, uh, many of us have been exposed to it, jury antibodies to it, and are able to deal with it. So uh, with leptospirosis, it has this path, this progression uh, that it takes. And so depending on your uh, fitness and how good your immune system is, you may be able to stop it back fairly easily. Uh, but if not, you had the first stage that uh, is pretty mild, and then you maybe not get back here. If not, you start to get uh, the signs of inflammation, nausea, vomiting, exhaustion. The second stage is where this becomes even more uh, invasive, more bacteria, and we start to have you know meningitis, not good. Uh, eyes become cloudy. Um, you start to have liver failure. That's what is causing the yellow to orange. Uh, in 10% of the cases, we actually have sufficient liver damage um, and kidney damage that you start to have uh, a pretty serious problem here. It can be severe. You can end up actually having uh, bleeding from the lungs. But most folks, when they get it, don't exhibit particularly any kind of disease. All right, now this is actually one of the bacteria that we were using. Um, and that is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And it is gram negative, um, aerobic. It is motile, it's able to move around a little bit. And um, it does have some, actually, some, you can recognize it with UV light. But um, so it is an opportunistic infection. So it's not particularly dangerous unless you've got some underlying conditions. Um, so if the host is immune compromised, and let's face it, immune compromisation comes from, you know, if you are on chemotherapy, that'll do it. If you've had a heart transplant or, or some sort of organ transplant, you're definitely gonna be immune compromised. As you get older and more enfeebled, you can become immune compromised. But just think about this is that, you know, a good case of the flu is an easy way to become immune compromised. And when we're taking, all of us taking the vaccine, um, it's having a bit of a uh, wallop on your immune system, and while you're not immune compromised, it does make you a bit weaker in terms of your immune system for the few days while your body is in fact dealing with the vaccine. And we can begin to have a variety of different kinds of uh, infections and things that are uh, possible, but primarily only if you're immune compromised. And so everything from uh, infections of the heart to infections of uh, different tissues. So there's a range of things that can be happening with this. Now, we can come about and not look at wounds, but actually looking at dermal infections, which, you know, the surface itself is pretty tough. So we need to abrade it a bit to be able to get a foothold. These dermal abrasions um, you know, is the peeling of the epidermis, scrapes, um, you know, rug burn, mat burn. And now we've got the bacteria that are primarily on our skin surface to begin with. And this is where we have things like um, 
staph epidermidis, um, staph aureus, and the one we were just looking at, uh, both, all these are going to be opportunistic infections that you have them on your skin surface. As long as you're in reasonable immune uh, condition, they're not going to be an issue. Uh, Staph aureus is present on all of us. If you were uh, to take your hand or your finger and put it on a uh, LB plate, you'd have a fingerprint that would show up with Staph aureus. And it is very often producing rashes, uh, boils, uh, cellulitis, which can actually be quite painful. Uh, immune compromised folks, um, often in the hospital, can end up with uh, the epidermidis and uh, arganosa infections. But again, if you're in a reasonably immune, uh, immune shape, you're not gonna have to worry about it. All right, other places that we can get these kinds of bacteria, um, things like catheters, and if you haven't been in the hospital situation, um, a catheter is often used to, um, you know, uh, for a time, to drain urine going up into uh, the bladder, and so bypassing the sphincter. And it's not a matter of if a bladder infection will occur, it's pretty much a matter of when a bladder infection occur. So catheterization is something that not necessarily avoided, but not used for long term. Uh, then there are a whole range of other catheter terms. There's um, catheters that are being used, you know, when you're starting an IV. Catheters being used for um, arterial um, implants and things. So any time that you breach the skin, this is an invitation. And so when you're setting up to do a simple injection, you wipe down the skin surface with the alcohol swab. When you're setting up to do an IV, you wipe it down a good bit better, and because you're maintaining that hole, you usually put some kind of dressing over the top of it. So we have to be very careful about breaching the skin. Uh, and particularly, um, epidermidis is a, a problem. Uh, biofilms, we've talked a little bit about, and are also a, a particular difficulty in that Biofilms can begin to cause uh, long-term infection as the bacteria are spread about. And we've got things like uh, a subvenous catheter, which you would put in like a pick line. Um, this is a catheter, an IV, that is being used a bit more permanently rather than a temporary IV. You have a, um, a bigger, uh, vein that you're going into and there's less risk of edema. Um, you have different kinds of like um, stents and things are a possibility of introducing bacteria. So for coronary stents, uh, a particularly difficult um, issue is artificial hip implants. The artificial hip implant, if you've never seen one, it looks like a trailer hitch attached to about a, uh, what, six inch um, tent spike. And that's a lot of metal. And the tent spike specifically is going directly into the big part of the femur. And you can get bacteria there. It can be really difficult to get antibiotics into that spot. And so the uh, development of a biofilm becomes a significant issue. And there are cases where people will have systemic infections in their hip implant and the only choice you have is to actually go in and remove it and then swab the whole area out and try again. So that's not good. <laughs> and that's why we have to maintain a lot of uh, very careful control um, over sterile fields and things. And, you know, it's one thing when you're giving somebody a shot. It's a whole other thing if you're starting an IV. And then it is next level if you're doing like a cardiac catheterization. So if you've not seen somebody getting a stent, and blessedly I have not, uh, they're going in generally through uh, the artery 
deep inside here or, or the uh, different veins in the leg, but pretty big and snaking this line all the way up and then actually being able to go to the blocked area and pop open the spring to open it up. But you're going into the, the arterial system and you're gonna be putting a fairly long bit of wire in there and so they take great care to sterilize that whole area. So the complexity of starting that is a good bit higher than starting an IV. Uh, starting an IV, if it's gonna be temporary, they probably will just wash it down. They may give you a bit of um, an iodine antiseptic solution like that, but not too bad. But when they're going into an artery and they're gonna be putting this thing up there for a while, they are a lot more careful. One of the things is an issue as well is uh, when you're introducing uh, something as simple as doing an a endoscope, uh, endoscope analysis for colonoscopy, you can introduce bacteria that way. Uh, it's a little bit different because you're not actually going into the uh, cellular system. You're still essentially on the outer surface, but bacterial infections still occur and terrorists can probably happen as well. So we have another kind of breach of the skin system though. And that is the use of what are known as vectors. And this is sort of a generic term that we use for the biting insects or for little organisms that live on top of you. They are considered disease vectors. And we've got a range of things some you may be familiar with, some uh, you potentially have on you or have had on you. We've got the Anopheles mosquito. There are a number of different mosquito strains or mosquito species, uh, mosquito genera, and different mosquito types can carry different kinds of viruses. Uh, the Zika virus which is something that our lab has been working on and messing around with. The Zika virus is carried by a very specific strain of mosquito that isn't found much north of St. Louis. And one of the concerns is with global climate change, as things start to get warmer, these mosquito strains can start moving up a little bit further north. And, you know, in a few years, we might start to see uh, the mosquito that can carry the Zika virus present in our part of the country. Um, and then whether it has the virus or not is a different issue, but at least there's changes that occur with these different vectors. Uh, the human body louse, um, if you've ever been walking around here, but particularly in Southern Illinois, you may be, fam uh, be familiar with different kinds of ticks and the deer tick, um, able to carry Lyme disease. Um, fleas can be on top of us. Um, the tsetse fly, sand fly, not so much found around here. Uh, so the vector is any animal that transmits diseases to another. Uh, you know, a skin bite, is as good as a hypodermic injection. And so if you don't have a, you know, a sterile field being laid out, when that mosquito is piercing you, there is a possibility of bacterial infection. So a good one to start with is the bacterium that causes the plague, the black death. Uh, Yersinia pestis. This is the bacterium that causes bubonic plague. Uh, when we think about, you know, in the Middle Ages and the plague mass doctors with their long tubes, this is what they were worried about. And it's carried primarily by the flea. And it bites and it introduces this bacterium, a gram negative, so pinky. Uh, it's a facultative anaerobe, meaning that it is able to grow in the presence of oxygen, but it um, uh, also can operate in an anaerobic environment. And you begin to get swelling in the lymph nodes and the buboes. These are the specific kinds of bulbous uh, infections. And then over time, you begin to have uh, profuse internal bleeding. Um, the buboes themselves can begin to rupture, spread the bacteria, and begin bleeding as well. So the way we begin to treat this is now it's a fairly easy, easily treated disease with antibiotics. 
and having reasonable sanitation. So the plague has been studied in a lot of different ways. And we could spend a lot of time about the history of the plague and the effects of it on the human population because it was, or it is, very severe. And left uncontrolled, it's a pretty much of a, uh, a serious killer. So there are a couple of different kinds of um, ways the bacteria can get a hold on you, which results in these different varieties, but they are, in fact, caused by the same bacteria. <coughs> So bubonic plague uh, is highly contagious. We have the lymph nodes collecting the bacteria, and they start to turn black and swell. Um, you end up with pneumonia as it gets into the lungs, and organ hip failure, um, pretty lethal. Uh, it's spread uh, with the lymphatic system, and the infected uh, flea bites you, and now like there's something itching on my leg. Oh, great. And that has causing the entry of it. Uh, there is pneumonic, which is also getting more into the lungs and coming out uh, through coughing and things. Uh, this is even more lethal than uh, the bubonic plague. Uh, septicemic plague, again caused by the same bacterium. Uh, the bacteria are getting in the bloodstream, and let's face it, if you've got bacteria in the bloodstream, that ain't good. So we got a 99 to 100% fatality here. Uh, there are a variety of virulence factors. There's some anticoagulation factors, and there's an endotoxin the bacteria can produce to prevent clotting and cause you to start bleeding from various orifices. Uh, there's the capsule. You end up with death often um, by septicemic shock, that is, you have so much of this toxic material in the body, and even after a time, antibiotics aren't gonna work because you still got the bacteria in you. So it's a fairly nasty kind of death, but phenomenally easy to treat with antibiotics. If you ain't got no antibiotics, <laughs> this is what happens though, is that you have pandemics. Uh, and there is all, all kinds of interesting historical ramifications of the Black Death. Uh, over a third of the population uh, died, and particularly among the working poor, the peasants, resulting in a labor shortage. And this, in turn, generates uh, the scarcity of labor that potentially has resulted in modern society. So the plague was constantly a problem, and you'd have the plague sort of swelling up as you have more individuals that are infected and coughing and spreading it, and then it would fade back, and then it comes back up. And you know, we're not gonna really get into too much things like Ebola, but depending on how nasty the infection is, the ability to spread it might be limited. If something like Ebola knocks people down so hard, so fast, that you don't really have the opportunity to go traveling around too much and spreading it so far. So, it's a bit of a serious problem. Uh, another infection that actually occurs, uh, we see it in little bunny rabbits, and it can also get transmitted into uh, humans, is tularemia. And um, Francisella tularensis. It is uh, a pretty small bacterium, a, uh, a cacobacillus, uh, meaning little individual dots. And gram negative, so again, a pinky. Um, we see it primarily in, well, in Missouri, <laughs> uh, South Central Midwest. It's also in different pockets uh, of rural areas. That's probably us. Uh, it is found in rabbits and different kinds of rodents. Uh, pretty much rabbits are probably gonna carry uh, tularemia. And then it's transferred, again, by tick bites. Um, also, it can be aerosolized, but primarily by tick, uh, tick bites. And it is going to affect the parts of the body that we kind of expect to see bacterial infections. The lymph nodes are a good place. Uh, other organs as well. And it produces fairly uh, mild symptoms. Uh, fever, lethargy. We can think of it as plague-like. Uh, 
it's generally going to be something that you can recover from. Um, not particularly lethal in terms of compared to Black Death, anyway. Uh, we'll stop here and get into Lyme disease when we get back on Monday. So, let's see. Really good areas to get Lyme disease up in Wisconsin. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, there's a lot of ticks in Southern Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, that must be like, you know, um, Eastern? I'm not sure what's over there. Huh. Charleston is a good place to get it. Over here back to Charleston, don't you dare. What are you going to do? I'm going to Wisconsin. Oh, you're bringing it back to Tate? Good. Oh. All right. Uh, do you ever worry about Lyme disease? Do you ever think about it? Shit, it's the kind of thing of like, I didn't before, but now I do. Uh, the nice thing about Lyme disease is that if you don't have that tick on you for a pretty good long time, the ability to transmit the bacteria um, is not something that happens. Um, I hate it when I find a tick on my pup, but, you know, I we do tick check pretty regularly. I go hunting in Southern Illinois, and we always 